Um, we're going to go ahead and have the announcements, and then we got some special music coming up. This is going to be a great day. I told Trish coming up this morning, I haven't been in too many church services where we got to have a baptism and observe the Lord's Supper in the same service, where God, the two ordinances that Jesus commanded us until he returns um, get to participate in both today. What a beautiful day in the Lord's house. Um, as, uh, if you would take your bulletin out, we've got a couple of updates on our prayer list I want our church family to be aware of. Um, we've added Carlos Martinez. Uh, he's having some liver issues. Uh, Going to be con seeking after some doctors, uh, getting help with that. So we want to be faithful to pray for Carlos. Um, we've added Lisa McKnight. That's Amber's cousin. Uh, she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I, I, I told him in Sunday school this morning, I was grateful, praising the Lord, that our list shortened because Janet Cavazos, our neighbor, said, you can take me off your list. Uh, my surgery went well, and I'm doing great. Um, we took uh, Adam Nimitz off. He's doing well at kind of his new normal. He's at school doing what he does. Praise the Lord for that. Um, so uh, God is moving in the, in the lives and the hearts of, uh, of a lot of people, and we're just so thankful for that. Uh, but do be faithful to pray for these this week. Uh, Audrey Oliver's home. She's continually improving, um, which is a blessing from God. So um, as far as announcements, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper today. Tomorrow is infamous Uncle Flush's birthday. Wes Thompson has a birthday tomorrow. Um, along with my mother-in-law, Sandra Hynote, her birthday's tomorrow. Um, and October 2nd, we'll have our men's and women's Bible study here. Please come and be a part of that. Uh, the men are still going through the, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and the ladies are in their study in Galatians. Uh, wonderful, wonderful time in the Word and in the Lord. Um, and then October 4th, Dustin Hood has a birthday. 25 again uh, so we pray for the praise for that and then October 19th is our church fall festival uh, this is going to be a great time of outreach for our church for our community uh, there's still a sign-up sheet over here of things that uh, booths that need to be manned tasks that need to be done uh, so uh, take a look at that and sign up wherever you feel led to serve uh, we do need bags of candy and canned drinks so you can start bringing those whenever because um, those will be for prizes and refreshments what, during the fall festival. Uh, I'm excited what God's going to do in our midst. We've already had a baptism this morning. That's the greatest thing ever, man, seeing somebody that had their life radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I woke up today ready to preach. So uh, it's, it's a beautiful day in the Lord's house, and I'm just excited about what he's going to do. Uh, let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. God, I just thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for... Callista, the decision that she's made to follow you. Father, I pray that you'll bless her, guide her, sustain her in all, in all her ways, Father, and God, that she'll acknowledge you. And God, I just pray that as we move forward with this time of worship, Father, God, that we will come before you with clean hearts and that we will worship you today in spirit and truth because you are worthy. Father, we pray for these that we've mentioned that are battling health conditions. We pray for a healing, miraculous touch in their lives. And God, just pray that you'll be glorified in the midst of circumstances that don't seem good. Because God, even when things aren't good, you still are. And so God, we just praise you for caring and just ask you to intervene in their lives in a supernatural way. Father, we pray that as we continue our worship, Father, may it be pleasing to your ears. May it come from hearts that love you. God, and we pray above all that you'll be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Special singer can come up to the front this morning. How tall she is? She's getting taller. <laughs>
kingdom come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our this passage. We deliver us who was passed against us. Lead us not into patience, but deliver us from evil. Our dear Father.
of Ages, page 342.
never gets old. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. Thank you, thank you, mom and dads, for bringing your babies to church. Amen. Amen. If you would, please open your Bibles with me this morning to the Old Testament book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading verse 21 through verse 23 of Ezra chapter 8. And if you would, out of a reverence to the reading of God's word, if you're willing and able, please stand. Ezra chapter 8, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> the Bible says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahia, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to keep us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning seeking something I cannot obtain for myself. God, I just pray for an anointing, a fulfilling of your Holy Spirit to proclaim this message, Father. God, I pray that your words will flow out of my head, my mouth, my heart this morning. And God, I pray that lives will be changed because of the word of God. God, I just pray that you will bind Satan, bind his demonic forces from our midst. And Father, I just pray that that as we look into these events in the life of Ezra, Father, we will see that being a remnant in a godless, in a world that does not honor you, Father, that you are there with us, that you will protect and sustain us if we will seek after you. So, Father, I pray that you'll be glorified through the preaching of your word, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. <clears throat> Ezra is an interesting individual um, in the Bible. Um, Ezra was not a prophet. Ezra was actually a scribe. Uh, he was one that had been charged with writing and, and, and learning and knowing the law of God. And at this point in Israel's history, uh, they had been in Babylonian captivity for a lot of years. Uh, the Persians had taken over, and as a result of that, God changed the heart of King Artaxerxes, who was the Persian king, and began to give Ezra permission and authority and resources to go back to Jerusalem in order to start rebuilding the temple. Uh, Ezra knew that if the nation of Israel, that if the children of Israel were ever going to come together and get back to what God desired for them to be as his people, that they were going to have to begin in the temple. They were going to have to begin not just with the construction of the building, but with all of the sacrifices, keeping the feasts, keeping all of the things that God had commanded them to do in the law. And so Ezra was the one that was chosen. Uh, he went into the king, and the king says, yes, you can go back to Jerusalem. It would have been about a 900-mile journey from where they were located. And it, when you arrived there, he even sent gold and silver and things with them in order that they could establish the temple and begin the sacrifices and begin to worship their God the way that they were intended. Now, as we get into uh, chapter 8 today, we see that Ezra had done something that was absolutely mandatory. Prior to him leaving and departing for Jerusalem, um, he gathered together the men of Israel, not just any men. <coughs> he knew that if they were going to carry out the ceremonial sacrifices and the worship and all the things that took place in the temple, God had commanded that it be done by the Levites. And so as, as Ezra is getting this group together about to go on his journey to Jerusalem, he gathers a bunch of men together and he realizes, wait a minute, we don't have any Levites. Wait a minute, the ones that God has entrusted with, with uh, carrying out these, these, ser these services under the Lord in the temple, we don't have any of their descendants here. And so leading up into our text today, we see that he gathered these men together and a group of men came and gathered and 38 of them were of Levite descent. And there was another 220 some odd that were there as well that were servants within the temple. And so Ezra realized, I have the men of God that God had in place. Now we can begin our journey to Jerusalem. And I started thinking about that in our world today. Uh, this is a remnant group of people. This is what is left of the children of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. 
after being suppressed, after being persecuted, after being told they had to worship false gods, all the things that they went through while they were in captivity, now they're beginning to rebuild and to make their journey and their way back to the people that God desired for them to be. And I thought, man, what an application for the United States of America today. Uh, wouldn't it be great if all of the godly men in the country came together and began to take back all of the statutes and the foundations and the precepts of our faith in the presence of the wicked people that are around us. Amen? And it began with him gathering these people. We have to realize that the men are the ones that are responsible for coming together and being the leaders that God desires for us to be that we're to lead our families, that we're to lead people in the ways of the Lord. And so Ezra began to gather this group together. And uh, after he had done so, he began, he did a few very important things. Look with me there in our text today. The Bible says in verse 21, then. So after he gathered this group, they were all together. He did something very interesting. The Bible says, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava. So he knew the men are gathered. They know they're going back to Jerusalem. They know that it's important to establish the things of God once again. And he came in and he proclaimed a fast. Fasting is one of those spiritual disciplines that uh, is, is, is paramount if you ever really want to know and understand and have a closer walk with the Father. Because uh, uh, when we fast biblically, uh, we come in and we give up things in order to focus on God. It draws us closer to him. Jesus went and fasted before he was tempted in the wilderness. Jesus went up on the mountain to fast before he was arrested. Jesus would go and fast and, and prepare himself spiritually to face what came next. And so Ezra realized the importance of that, and he proclaimed the fast there at the river. He wanted every one of those men to understand and to be on the same page, that we're not just going back to Jerusalem, yay, I get to go home that we're going back to Jerusalem to establish the foundation of our faith and to establish the ways and the things of God for the people from this point moving forward. He understood the spiritual significance of that. And so he began by calling them together and he proclaimed a fast there at the river. And he gives the reason. He says that we might humble ourselves. Any time a people are going to be turned back to God, it begins with humility. We as Christians, as we walk through this life, need to walk in a mode of humility. We need to walk humbly before our God. We need to walk in humility before the almighty God of heaven. And so he calls them together. He calls for a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God. We have to understand that there is a God in heaven and I am not him. You are not either. Hope I didn't burst anybody's bubble today. He's the almighty sovereign of the universe. I am not. He created me. He is the creator. There is a huge gap between him and I. And Ezra recognized that, and he knew that they were never going to be successful in accomplishing what God wanted done if everyone was not focused and centered around the almighty, humbled before him in all things. And so he declares this fast. He says we're going to come in so we can humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way. Anybody ever do anything the wrong way or is it just me? I do wrong things all the time. But let me tell you, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to everything in our life, if we seek him, if we follow what he declares or the Holy Spirit impresses on our spirit to do, it will be the right thing. And Ezra knew that he had been given by God a great opportunity. Why did the king let him leave? Because God had impressed it on the king's heart to do so. Just like he did with Pharaoh when they came out during the Exodus. And so here he knew that the only way moving forward, they had to seek God in everything. Uh, uh, sometimes in our life, we feel like we're, we don't have a direction. I'm just kind of floundering around getting through each day. Let me tell you what, if you humble yourselves and you get on your face before a holy God, you seek him, he will show you the right way. And that's exactly what Ezra wanted to happen. He says, we're going to seek him for the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. It wasn't just a, hey, look at us, we're the godly men. He realized that what they were seeking was direction not only for them, but it affected the children. 
It affected the children. It was crucial. God, God declares that it is crucial that we pass on the things of the faith to our children, to the next generation. He wants to, us to understand that the sins of the father affect future generations. And here, Ezra wanted to get it all out there in the open. He says, God, we're seeking you because we want the right way for us, but we also want it for our children. They did not, he did not want their children to be raised and to grow up in a godless, wicked, pagan culture. And he knew that this group of men, because God had ordained it and was laying the path for the right way, were going to establish a foundation of faith that would impact generations for the kingdom of God. And so he comes in, he says, we want the right way for us, for our little ones, and all our possessions. Wait a minute, they were slaves. They had just been out, set out of captivity. How in the world did they have possessions? Um, the king sent with them gold, silver. He says, you use it to worship your God the way you choose. Anything that you have left over, you use it as you see fit. God changed the heart of King Artaxerxes and the, the children of Israel, this remnant, as they left, they left with wealth. They left with wealth. They left with possessions. But here, Ezra knew the heart of men. He knew that when uh, uh, possessions and large sums of money come into our lives, that oftentimes we do ungodly things with them. And so as he's praying this prayer, he's saying that we want to do the right way for all our possessions. We have to understand that everything that I have is given to me by a holy God. Everything that I have is a gift from him. It's all his, and I'm just a steward with it. There is nothing that I have, nothing in my life that didn't come from him. He gave me the very breath in my lungs that I'm giving out to you this morning. And when I begin to process and focus on possessions as being all his, then it should change my heart as to how I manage those and what I do with them. We should never withhold anything from God. If God puts on our heart and through the Holy Spirit encourages us to give, to do, to do something with a possession that we have, we better be obedient and do it because it all comes from him. Uh, sometimes we act like we, you know, God can't give me anymore. Man, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can give you everything you ever need plus some. He's a generous God. Uh, I had an uncle that ran a company for a lot of years and very successful. Uh, he was one of the most generous people I'd ever met in my life. And I asked him one day, I said, Uncle Hugh, how come you're so successful? Hey, I never went to college, no business degrees, none of that. He just hard work, built a company. He said, because I made a decision years ago that I was going to try to outgive God. I made a decision that no matter what he blessed me with, I was going to outgive him. He said, I gave, I gave. He blessed people. I saw him buy a car and hand the title to a young couple he didn't even know because they needed it. He tried to outgive God. He said, I finish second every single year. <laughs> Been doing this for years. He said, I've never won. I said, oh, yes, you have. You've won. But that's the approach we're supposed to have. And so Ezra knew that with these possessions came great responsibility, that they belong to God. And so he sought him. They fasted. They prayed. They sought the face of God as to how they were to follow the right way for themselves, their children, and all their possessions. We're not to be greedy for the kingdom. We're to be generous people because God's blessed us with so much. And so he's seeking this face. You can see the heart of Ezra here. Um, <clears throat> verse 22. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort. Now, he had favor with the king. The king was giving him basically anything he wanted because God had changed his heart. And he said, um, it's going to be a long journey. There's going to be problems. He said, but I was ashamed to ask the king for an escort. He said, he went on. He said, I didn't want to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy. Now, there's some great the theology right here that we need to look at. Number one, they're on a mission from God. You remember the Blues Brothers? We're on a mission from God. They were on a mission from God. God was laying the foundation for them to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple, to reinstate the sacrifices, to begin to worship the God the way that they'd been instructed to by the law of Moses. He was on a mission. And here, they, he, the Bible says that he was ashamed to request of the king escorts and soldiers and horsemen to help us 
against the enemy. Just because we are walking the path that God has us on, we're following and seeking and chasing after his will, does not mean we will be freed from encounters with the enemy. The enemy is going to show up and going to try to stop us every step of the way. Ezra knew that, but he was ashamed to go and ask the king for any help. He didn't want to go to the king and say, King, we've got a 900-mile journey coming up. Sure would be cool if you'd give us about, oh, I don't know, 500 horsemen and soldiers to escort us to where we need to go. That way, if the enemy attacks, then we'll be protected. That way, if the enemy attacks, then they can take care of business for us. Um, he said, I was ashamed to do that. And he gives the reason in the second part of the verse. He said, because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. They had gone in and the king had asked them, why are you wanting to go back and do this? And they began to tell him about how great their God is. And they said, our God's hand is over those that are doing good. Our God's hand is over his children. He protects and provides for the remnant. And so he's basically saying, I'd have been ashamed of myself and would have been undercutting or downgrading what God can do if I go in and seek protection from men. The Bible says some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so he stepped out on faith, him and these men said, we don't need your military, we don't need your government, we don't need your escorts, we are going to walk forward heading to Jerusalem to reestablish our faith, and we're going to do so under the hand of protection of Almighty God. He said, and I'd be ashamed to even go and ask, and then yet here we are in 2024. What do we do? Oh, government, help me. Oh, military, help me. Do not think for a minute I'm downgrading our military. They're the greatest men and women God put on this earth. They're there defending the freedom that we're enjoying today. But let me tell you what, the level of security that any military can provide fails in comparison to the hand of the almighty God that created all of this. And so here he said, I was ashamed to even go and request, so he didn't do it. He said, and he said, because I said so. He had the talk. My God is great. My God can do anything. You ask people, do you think there's anything God can't do? No, then why don't we trust him? Why, oh, meddling now. Why don't we trust him? He's capable of everything. We don't need man's help. You have to understand how Israel was set up. They were never intended to have a king. They, they asked for one. They were never intended to have a military. They didn't need one. They were told, you follow and worship and obey me, and I will take care of everything else. That's what God said. But yet they begin to look at their problems through the lens of men. And we do that at times. We look at the circumstances in our life and we try to think of a way. How can God solve? How can I solve this? How can I get out of this? How can I make it through this? And we begin to put God in a box and limit him to what men can do. He's not man. He is the holy God of heaven. He is the one that is capable of doing anything he desires. And so Ezra got it. He said, man, I was ashamed to go ask. I didn't even bother to ask because we had spoken to the king. We told him how good our God is. That, that the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. We should desire and seek and chase after our relationship with the Father. He paid a very dear price in order for us to make that available. It was his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, we have access to the Father. We have to quit uh, trying to do things in our own strength. We have to get, get to the point that we're building and walking our, our relationship with the Father. Ezra got it. He said that, that the, the hand of God is upon all those for good who seek him. And then my favorite word in Scripture, but. God protects and blesses the remnant, those that are seeking and chasing after him. His hand of favor is upon them, but. His power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Um, I say it all the time. That all is a three-letter word that means all. Here he's declaring to them, God put, keeps his hand of protection upon those who seek him. Uh, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Those that turn against, reject, and deny the power of Almighty God, those that, that reject the gospel message, those that turn and mock our God, the Bible says that wrath and his power come against them. 
the days of people standing up and outwardly mocking and defying the holy God of heaven are soon coming to an end because he is not going to be mocked for long. There's going to come a time when he is going to say that is enough and he is going to execute his justice and his judgment upon the earth. And so Ezra is declaring here, the reason we're fasting, praying, and seeking God is because we want to be in his favor. We want his hand of protection around us. But those that forsake him are facing the power and the wrath of the Almighty. I don't ever want to be caught in the crosshairs of that. How does that affect us today? Um, we have to be sure. We have to be devoted. We have to be committed in our walk with the Father. We have to be committed to standing firm for the things of God with boldness. We want to follow him and chase after him so that his hand of protection is over us. We don't want to be in his wrath. We don't want to experience that kind of power of destruction that he can bring if we forsake him. We're the ones, we're the remnant. We're the ones that are supposed to stand in these last days. They were a remnant. They were what was left of the children of Israel that had gone into captivity, and now God's leading them out. They were headed toward Jerusalem, and I began to think about this, this analogy that came into my spirit that we're no different. Here we are, a remnant church. Uh, I, I told some kids at Fellowship of Christian Students this week, I said, you know what? We are way in the, the minority. There's a whole lot more people out there that don't, walk, that don't follow God, that don't believe in our God, than there are in here that do. We are the remnant. We're what's left. But the same God that brought the remnant with Ezra out of captivity is the same God that's going to lead this remnant all the way into the new Jerusalem that we have awaiting for us one day. There's coming a day where we're going to get to spend eternity in glory in the presence of the Father. We're going to dwell where he dwells. We're going to be in his presence for all eternity because we've accepted his gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. The journey is the same. The remnant is the same. The God of heaven is the same. He doesn't change. And so as I began, as I was reading through this, as I was studying, preparing this week, it just gave me some great hope to think that, you know what? I saw what happened with Ezra and these men. And God can do the same exact thing through the remnant church today in our time, in our, in our day. He's still the same God. He's still going to protect, provide, because we're not going to forsake him. And then in verse 23, I'll close with this. He said, so we fasted and entreated our God. We fasted and entreated. We pled our case. We begged and asked the Father. We brought our concern before him. We entreated the God of heaven, our God. We have a personal relationship with him through Jesus. He's our God. He's personal. He's real. And he wants to have a real impact in our life every day. He says we, we fasted and we entreated our God for this. That's a big special word, this. Because it implies specificness. My least favorite word in the English language to say. My tongue gets wrapped around my lips. can't get it out. They were praying together for a specific purpose. They were a group of men that had come together that were on the same page. They had the same agenda, if you will. They were wanting to seek God. They were humbling themselves before him so that they could walk in his protection to lay the foundation of faith for the future generations. That hasn't changed. That's exactly what we need to be doing today. So he comes in and he, and, and he says, we fasted and entreated our God for this. It is time that as a church, that, that when there's problems and issues come up in our lives, that come up in the life of this church, we need to be on the same page. We need to be praying together in agreement with one another on things that God puts on our hearts. So I can say, God, I want you to act in this. I want you to act in this, God. This is what I'm bringing before you, specifically praying for the needs that, that I have, specifically praying for the glory that he deserves, specifically praying that he will intervene in my life in a supernatural way. I believe that the God of heaven is capable of doing anything he pleases. And I believe that he takes delight in, in empowering his children through the Holy Spirit to do incredible things for his glory. And I want to be praying, fasting, entreating, seeking him specifically on things that I want him to do in my life. And Oftentimes we start, we get to this point where we pray very generally. When we serve a God that's a God of details. He's, he's a God of, of uh, he, he, he knows everything. And we need to come before him specifically. I, I, I'm trying to get into this new habit that when people come and they ask me that, that you know, they're dealing with a situation, they ask me to pray with them or pray for them about this. 
um, my response is it, I'm trying to get it conditioned to where it's automatic, where it's how do you specifically want me to pray? How do you specifically want me to pray for you or for this loved one? What are we specifically praying for? So that we can come together and pray in agreement specifically for something, and then God can move. Because what he's doing when that happens is he begins to weave the hearts together of brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're praying together in one accord for a specific thing. And then God's like, "Woo! I got a bunch of Baptists to be unified on something. Praise the Lord. Watch this. Boom. And he'll move. He'll move. And so here he's saying that, that they fasted, they entreated our God for this. And then look at the response. Very simple. And he answered our prayer. When we approach God humbly and the way that he deserves to be approached, when we seek him out in repentance, in humility, and then we lift our request to him, that's what they were doing. And the Bible said he answered our prayer. I can't tell you the countless times I've had people come to me and they say, I just feel like God's not answering my prayers. And I think, well, how are you praying? You know? Um, because a, a lot of the time with God in my life, what I've experienced that the answer to the prayer is not yet or not now and, and no's an acceptable answer too, by the way, you know, some, sometimes God tells us no, but remember it's for our own good. Um, but what do we do? I, I, I soul up and I get mad because God didn't do what I wanted him to do. I want God to do what he wants to do in my life. And so that's what the, the heart that Ezra and these men came together with. They sought the Lord. They humbled themselves before him. They fasted. They prayed. They entreated him for specific things. And the Bible says, God, answered your prayers. You will never have an effective, powerful, consuming, awesome, wonderful, hopeful, joyful prayer life until we get our, we repent and humble ourselves before the Almighty of Heaven. Our prayer life should include more than us thanking God for the food that He blessed us with at the table. It should be a time of fellowship and it's a time of worship, where where we go in and we get along with the Father, where we come together as a group to pray for specific things, and it's a time where we're acknowledging that He's God and we're not. And when we get our hearts to that place and we begin, we begin to pray in that manner, we begin to seek his face in all things, the Bible says he, then he'll answer. And let me tell you, when that happens, the answer is spot on. God will never lead us astray when we're humbly, reverently, repentantly seeking him. He desires that because he wants that relationship with us. So what do we take from Ezra? As part of the remnant in these last days, church, we have nothing to fear. Don't be afraid. Fear is not of God. We can move forward in the days ahead, the things that lie ahead. You look at the news, it is a mess. Everything's a mess. Lord, please be with the people in North Carolina. Be with the people in Florida and Georgia that are suffering today. God, meet their needs today. God, be with the things going on in our world, all of the problems. But let me tell you what, there's not a single thing that caught our God by surprise this morning. He woke up, to, he didn't even wake up. <laughs> he was sitting on his throne where he's always been and where he's always going to be. We can trust the God of heaven with everything in our lives. And when we do that, when we come before him in that manner, then he can do incredible things in our lives. We're a remnant church. We're the leftovers. We're the ones that are created for such a time as this. And God will protect and provide for his remnant just like he always has when we humble ourselves and move forward seeking him. All glory to the Father. Heavenly Father, I come before you in Jesus' name, and I just thank you for who you are. God, I pray that we will be a people that seek you, that entreat you, that humble ourselves before you, Father, and God, that you'll be glorified in, in our lives, God, that you will move in our midst. Father, we want to see your glory fall in our lives. We want your glory to fall on Sardis Baptist Church. We want to be a part of what, the, what you're going to do in your remnant church in these last days, Father. God, I pray that we'll get our hearts right before you. God, that we'll come before you in repentance, that we'll come before you humbly. And God, knowing that when we do, then we can hear from you and we can follow your direction, Father. So God, I pray for each one under the sound of my voice. Father, if there's someone here today that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, 
that today would be the day of salvation. We cannot have a relationship with you until we go through the doorway of your son, Jesus. So I pray that, that if there's anyone here, that they'll repent of their sins, believe the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and be saved. And God, I pray for the rest of us that we will have hearts and have a passion, have a burning desire to chase after you. Father, we'll humble ourselves and we'll entreat you in all things, specifically, Father. And God, that you will allow your hand to be upon us. And God, that you will bless us as you guide us through until you safely call us home. So God, we give you glory for what you've done so far in our midst and what you're going to do. Be glorified in this invitation is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing hymn number 602. I have decided to follow Jesus. You respond as we sing. church this morning. Amen. Amen. We're not done yet. Alex, Eric, you come forward. This is Alex and Eric Johnson, and they're coming to join Sardis Baptist Church, uh, First Baptist Maydale, and on his profession of faith, been born again, baptized, and wants to be a part of what God is doing here. If you receive them based on these professions, would you say amen? Amen. 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 They've already been here for a while, and they're uh, already a blessing to us, and we're going to be a blessing to them. We're going to serve the Lord faithfully moving forward. You come by after our uh, Lord's Supper and give them a give them a hand of fellowship and welcome them. So thank you guys. Let me see. Amen. Amen. We're going to now observe the Lord's Supper. It's one of the ordinances that Christ commanded. Um, and if you would have a seat, and those that I've asked to come and help, would you please come forward? Nick, I'm trying to.